from downtown Milwaukee, welcome to Money Talk with Bob Landis. Each week, professional advisors from Landis and Company Investments discuss the latest financial developments, offering timely insight and long-term perspective. This is Money Talk for April 8th, 2022. The Bucks wrap up the regular season this weekend and get ready for the playoffs. And baseball is back. The Brewers have games with the Cubs and the Orioles before the home opener this Thursday. And just when you thought we were done with the slap, confused people are still sending harsh and rude tweets to Maryland Senator Will Smith. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> they probably think the governor's a fresh Prince of Bel Air. <laughs> An Ohio woman, after being arrested for stealing a car in California, was scheduled to appear in court. So how did she get to court, you ask? Well, that's right. She stole another car. (laughs) A British restaurant is trying to find the owner of an unusual piece of lost and found property. That would be a full set of teeth. The first clue to finding the owner would be find the person who orders all their meals in a blender. (laughs) And how about this? China has snake wine. There's a whole snake in a bottle of wine. You could assume the snake is dead, but you'd be wrong. (laughs) To celebrate his birthday, a father made a toast, and that's when the snake bit him in the mouth. Ever since the Garden of Eden, snakes have been getting a bad rap. (laughs) And finally, Delbert Hall of Cincinnati annually gives up food for its 40 days of Lent. He's back this year with his all beer and nothing but beer diet. Over the past three years, he's lost 85 pounds and raised over $30,000 for charity. But before starting his diet, he did get some great medical advice from his doctor. She told him, if you do this, you're an idiot. (laughs) (laughs) On the podcast today, we have Art Rothschild, Paige Radke, Joel Driesing, and wrapping up the week, here's Kyle Tedding. Well, thanks, Max. Uh, A tough week overall for markets. The S&P down 1.3%, closing today at 44.89. The Dow Jones Industrial Average down three-tenths of a percent only, closing today at 34.723. And the NASDAQ down 3.9%, closing today at 13.711 for the year. The S&P now down 5.5%, the Dow down 4 and the NASDAQ down 12.2%. Despite what was a pretty rough week overall for the NASDAQ, I think pretty obvious what's going on. You look at the yield on the benchmark 10-year Treasury, uh, rose from 2.38% at the end of last week up to 2.71%. I think largely because of some of the conversations surrounding the Fed this week. We got news on uh, what actually uh, was discussed in the last Fed meeting this week. But beyond that, we also got some information Uh, from some various conferences that have been held uh, by Fed members over the past few weeks, and in particular this week. And so, Art, I think as we kind of look at markets this week, it's clear the Fed's the thing that kind of remains in focus here. Yeah, and and, and what is there that's happening that shouldn't have been expected? Um, The Fed um, has been, you know, broadcasting or forecasting uh, that they were going to be doing what they're doing. And this week, the news got a little more um, solid, quite frankly. They will be uh, likely raising rates at a, at a quicker clip. Um, that could have been expected. As a matter of fact, it was expected before the last meeting, but for the Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine. And then the uh, runoff of the uh, uh, bond portfolio that they have um, that sounds like it's going to be pretty big and pretty fast. So anyone who was concerned about Fed policy, whether they're early or late or doing too little or too much, um, decided to sell but once again, the pattern is very strange. It has been all year. You have a day of selling, a day of buying, a day of selling, a day of buying. Um, but the pattern seems the, the same. Um, and it, it, quite frankly, the damage hasn't been all that bad. You know, when you, you consider we're only down uh, under 6% you know, year to date on the S&P. So again, it's just another pretty normal week for this year um, in, in a time in which we have uncertainty with respect to Ukraine you know, as well as the Fed. And so, again, I'm, I'm quite frankly thrilled with how well stocks have held up and, and not that disappointed in how poorly, you know, bonds have done um, this year, you know, given 
the circumstances. Are, can I ask you, because you've been around for a while, but the, the Very feds... Very old. The, yeah, <laughs> that goes without saying. The, the Fed's more transparent now, as you're pointing out. What difference does that make, and how does this compare with in the past when past feds haven't been? Yeah, I, I think, quite frankly, in the, the 30 years I've been here, this is we, we've got the best communicator as, as head of the Federal Reserve um, that I've seen. I mean, and they've, they've gotten better, you know, each time. And furthermore, the governors seem to be lined up pretty well. So we had a uh, few of the Fed governors speaking out this week. They're all moving in the same direction. Um, so I do think that should be helpful to the markets. A lot of the articles this week were talking about how what was it that people took so long to figure out? Um, so I think this transparency has helped. And I think over time, and, and this is a pattern that always seems to be out there, um, it, they treat everything like it's new. Um, but this is pretty much, as you and I have talked about before, baked in the cake, so to speak. We can expect higher interest rates. It just took till this week that there was more of a realization that this is serious. So, yeah, I think the, the, the tremendous communication from Jerome Powell is going to help them as they try to accomplish this very difficult, you know, objective of, you know, reducing inflation uh, without causing a recession. And Art, one thing that I think is pretty interesting, too, is, you know, leading up to this year, anytime the Federal Reserve talked about raising interest rates, you saw stocks go down. Last month, when they came out with their press conference after the meeting, you saw, you saw stocks rally. And so arguably, you would assume that it was because we got some sort of clarity on what their plan was going to be. And now with the release of the minutes, again, you would think that that would just provide more clarity about a situation that we all already knew what was going to happen. Um, so I find it very interesting that once we got the actual wording of their conversations, the market had a very different reaction to just that press conference. Um, and I also think it's important to note, too, that, like you said, it's not just the, meet, the meeting minutes, it's not just the meeting press conferences, but the Federal Reserve chairs have speaking engagements all through these cycles. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that I was looking at, and this was specific to Lael Brainerd, who is traditionally a much more dovish, dovish Fed chair, um, has always been a you know proponent of lower interest rates, easier monetary policy. And I think that was a big trigger for the market this week when she came out and said that, you know, had a, had a much more hawkish tone about reducing the balance sheet, the possible 50 point, point basis. 50 basis point increase. Um, and that, I think, took some people by surprise. But again, it really shouldn't have been a surprise to those of us that have been paying attention. I think consistency of messaging has been the piece that's been most important to see. You go back to the taper tantrum, the last time we talked about unwinding balance sheets and raising rates. Um, and while the, the pain of that was fairly short-lived and markets, I think, pretty quickly recovered, um, for a while, we went through this cycle where good news was bad news for the markets, uh, and anything that was supportive of the Fed being able to take further actions to remove easy money policies was something that took markets down. And I think so far, uh, you know, while this week wasn't a great week for stocks, while the S&P was down a little bit, I think it's clear that the pieces that will be hurt the most are the, the most rate-sensitive pieces. It's why growth stocks uh, and, you know, again, headlined by the NASDAQ, why growth stocks sold off so significantly this week, uh, because very much uh, the economic data points to the fact that maybe the Fed can follow through with some of these conversations. They're talking about $95 billion unwinding from the balance sheet, uh, ramping up to $95 billion, so maybe not starting there in May, but certainly getting their way up to that uh, as time progresses. And that's a far bigger number than what we were talking about the last time the Fed was discussing tapering. And so I think important to note that the data, at least the data that the Fed's looking at, suggests that right now the, the real risk is inflation. The real risk is uh, trying to get uh, pricing more stable uh, rather than simply looking at the employment picture. And so, you know, we've talked quite a bit about the economic data, Joel, the past few weeks. And I think, you know, the, the employment picture continues to be something that's fairly fairly strong. Yeah, Kyle, we had the latest numbers on the unemployment insurance claims. And those, although they, they were revised, there's an annual revision to those. Um, they're the lowest ever. They've been tracking these numbers for 55 years. And, and um, the, the four-week moving average that we look at is now the lowest it's ever been. It's about half of what the average has been over those 55 years. And, you know, whether it's the revision or not, it's it's just underscoring how 
tight the labor market is right now, that, that employers aren't letting workers go, which says a good thing for the economy because employers aren't going to hang on to workers just because it's a tight market. You know, they need workers, so they're going to hang on to those workers. So, um, so that's a very impressive uh, number that we came out with this week. Yeah, and looking at some of the other economic data, I think, you know, you, you see a number of other areas where there's strength, and I think that strength will be felt in economic growth, that strength will be felt in continued support of the employment landscape. One of the things that's very important to the economy is consumer spending. That's 70% of what drives the, the GDP. And we had numbers uh, yesterday from the Fed looking at, um, they call it revolving credit. Uh, it's basically credit card debt. And um, that's uh, you know now within 3% of where it was the peak before the, the recession, the COVID recession that happened in 2020. Um, so just to put that in perspective, um, during the Great Recession, it took a decade to get back to where that peak was before that recession. And now, you know, we're on the three-yard line if you're making a football analogy, and um, that's that's an impressive thing. And, and one, of the th- one of the numbers behind that is that, um, you know, part of the stimulus package that um, the Congress and, and the presidents, both of the last presidents, had something to do with and, and put some money in people's pockets so they could spend it so the economy could keep growing. Um, you know, the, the consumers have 90 billion. No, I'm sorry. Um, they, they, they've got um, a lot more money than they owe. Oh, here it is $186 billion more now. Uh, in their pockets at the end of, of 2021 than they did two years earlier before the, the recession, before COVID. So, you know, that's $186 billion more in personal savings that people can feel a little more confident at spending and, and using their credit cards for. And of course, the the risk right now, I think, is that inflation makes that $186 billion look a little less attractive than what it otherwise might have. And so it's why we see the Fed combating uh, inflation the way they are, raising rates, uh, pairing the balance sheet, certainly. I think the concern, of course, is what those rising rates mean for our bonds. And Paige, I know that's a, a conversation you have with clients all the time. I think the biggest concern, of course, is that we've already seen a pretty significant decline, especially in those longer dated bond funds. But uh, if the Fed continues on this path, you know, what what's left to expect? Yeah, so I, I think that's one of the big things that we're looking at with the bond market is obviously the the differences in the yield curve. And if you look at the yield curve from last year to this year, what you've seen is the shorter intermediate term rates rise cr- quite a bit, whereas on the longer term, you know, they've they've moved some, but not as much as you would have expected relative to to everything that's going on. And so, um, as interest rates continue to go up on the short end, you know, I'm going to be p- paying really close attention to what the yield curve looks like, whether it's going to be an upward shift overall, or if we're going to continue to see this difference between how the different maturities are reacting to these shifts. Um, and ultimately, I think you know the most important thing to remember is no one likes to see their bond portfolio down. It's meant to be your safe money. And if you're looking over a trailing 12 month, stocks are handedly outperforming on the bond side. Um, I, I'm not necessarily anticipating that we're going to see some sort of recession, but the yield curve is pointing to that possibility. And if we do get to that point, the balance that you have in your portfolio is going to become more and more important. And it's going to be the corporate earnings that take take a harder hit. So it's never going to be time to abandon your bond portfolio. I think that now you just have to be a little bit more sensitive to what the duration is on your holdings, which is essentially how sensitive it's going to be to move in interest rates. Um, I would like that to be a one-for-one comparison, but you have to remember that that's a complicated math math calculation, and um, it's not always going to be a one-for-one. So there's lots of other things within the bond market that is impacting the actual returns of your portfolio. So just keeping an eye on it, not making any big moves that are going to put your your long-term returns in jeopardy, um, but also not abandoning bonds overall. Yeah, I think that's such a critical point, Paige, that as we look at our bond portfolio, yeah, it's taken a bit of a hit so far because rates have moved higher. Uh, the potential for rates to, to move further higher is an important thing to consider. But just like in stocks, how we try to avoid timing the market, right? We try to avoid calling bottoms and tops because 
there's a pretty significant risk to being wrong. The same is true for bonds, that there's a pretty significant cost to missing uh, even a couple of days uh, in terms of rate movement. And so I think as we kind of look at the role that they play, you rightfully point out that uh, you know, that's the piece that's supposed to dampen volatility. Should recession be in the cards? Should some uh, economic hardships be on their way? Um, that would be something that could change the rate outlook pretty quickly. Uh, and certainly then, you know, you'd be pretty grateful you have your bonds. I think the reverse of that is betting on the future, right? Betting that things actually get better from here. That's the the reason you have stocks. But as importantly, those bonds are also going to play a greater role. Because remember, we talked about the Fed potentially having a 50 basis point move coming up in May, maybe another 50 basis point move, uh, you know, sometime down the road this year, all of a sudden you're getting paid a lot more to hold those bonds. And so while you've taken a little bit of a hit initially, uh, and I want to stress, you know, that initial hit really is only over the last six months or a year. When you look at longer term returns, bonds actually still look okay. Um, but you're you're taking that pain right now for much higher potential returns on your bonds down the road. You know, Art, I think as we, we kind of circle back on this idea that maybe the last six months or a year hasn't looked great for bonds, uh, balanced portfolios have struggled to you know, keep their heads above water over the last year. I think we may be missing some of uh, how strong returns were leading up to that point in time, uh, even factoring in what was a pretty uh, substantial uh, market correction because of COVID. You know, you look at the three-year, five-year, 10-year numbers for a balanced portfolio, investors should be very happy with where they are. Um, and if all you're doing is looking at the last six months or a year, you might be missing some of the positive. Yeah, that's an important point. Um, everything has to be taken in the context of long-term goals and objectives. So here we are every week talking about what just happened in the week economically or in the markets. When you look at the, the drumbeat of better economic news over the past two years, I mean, just about every week we've had better economic news. Um, higher interest rates, you know, sure, you know, cost you something in the returns of your bond funds, but that also means that in the future, short-term yields are going to be better. And you and I have talked about how good, you know, cash is um, as, as a place to park money that you're going to need in the near term. But getting back to your question about the longer-term rates of return, um, I took a quick look at a couple sample portfolios, you know, recently, and we're doing this every day in the context of reviews with our clients. And we all know that everybody is, has lost money this year in equities and in bonds, so it's pretty tough to have made money, you know, in the first quarter. And not to mention that first quarter, I think, was the first down quarter in two years um, since we lost a whole boatload of money in the, in the bear market that was the pandemic uh, decline. Um, but if then you stretch out, and you can do this easily, you know, in the Morningstar portal, if you stretch out and you look at how you did over 12 months, well, most people are probably up a little bit, one, two, three, four, five, whatever percent, not huge. You go back three years, I mean, likely nine, 10, 11, you know, 12 percent even, you know, in a balanced portfolio, depending on what you have. And, it, and, and so five years, maybe eight, nine, 10 percent, 10 years, eight, nine, 10, seven, whatever it is, you made a lot of money which does help if you're concerned about what might happen in the future, or quite frankly, we all get a little older every year. And so as we move closer to the point at which we might have to harvest something out of our portfolios, especially with all these concerns about, you know, Russia invading Ukraine, and oh no, the Fed is doing this, and it might cause um, a recession. Well, we're a long ways from that. Um, so I, I think it's important that you always look at your current returns in the context, as you suggest, of longer term rates of returns, and furthermore, in the context of why you have what you have in the first place, to help you make money over long periods of time without losing too much over these short periods of time. And I think, quite frankly, everything I've looked at suggests our portfolios are holding up quite well because they are balanced, because we constantly and perpetually rebalance. So yeah, keep our fingers crossed as to what lies ahead, but I think we've done pretty well so far. Well, Art, thanks. Uh, thank you all for listening. We enjoy doing the program. We'll talk to you again next week. Thank you for listening to Money Talk with Bob Landis. If you have a financial question you want answered on next week's show, email it to moneytalk at landis.com. To keep informed throughout the week, visit our Money Talk page at landis.com.